I give you everything you want. Connie Mendez Introduction We assume that you have already read and studied the first book of this series, entitled Metaphysics for Everyone. To understand these New Age teachings well, and to obtain all the benefits they contain, it is advisable to start at the beginning, which is the principle of mentalism. This is because everything in the universe and in creation, is based on this principle, and without knowing it, one walks blindly. Look for it, acquire it, it will not weigh you down. I give you whatever you want. First step, write down on a piece of paper, in order of importance to you, all the things you want, and without fear of asking too much, because the strength that I am going to give you to know, knows no limitation. Second step, read your list when you wake up, and also before you go to sleep. Third step, think often of your desires, enjoy imagining them, and whenever you remember them, you must say, thank you Father, that you have already given the order that they be conferred on me. Fourth step, do not tell anyone what you are doing. This is very important, because if you tell anyone, all the strength dissipates, and you will not see your desires fulfilled. That is all. Now, for your own satisfaction, be splendid with yourself. Don't say on your list that you want a little house, even a tiny one. Ask for the size that suits you and pleases you. If it is money, mention the amount. If it is work, indicate what kind, the salary you aspire to, the conditions, and the most convenient location for you. Start in your first list with simple things, and so you get used to see wonders fall and happen. Since you have never done this before, you will not believe that it is possible, and I warn you that this doubt, may cost you not to see what you have asked for. It is natural for you to have doubts and mistrust, because the idea is new to you. But when you feel skepticism, pessimism, etc., take out your list, read it, and give thanks again. Giving thanks for what you have not yet seen, is the most positive way to manifest faith. Jesus Christ, on several occasions, emphasized this practice, as he notoriously demonstrated, before feeding five thousand people, with five fish and five fishes. When you look up to heaven and give thanks, at the moment of breaking the first loaf of bread, you will treasure that every time you read your list, you will first have to cross out some points, because they will have already been realized. Then, you will have to do it again, putting other points, in the most important places. Don't worry, this is natural, it happens to everyone. What happens is that your higher self will indicate that many of these desires are already within your reach, while there are others that are not so much. Do not judge the way in which they will be given to you, because this is counterproductive. The great spiritual force, is beyond your human understanding. Accept what will be given to you with gratitude, do not interrupt or repress it, and above all, do not think, say, or exclaim upon seeing your desires fulfilled, can it really be because of this? It does not seem possible. If what you thought is that all this, was going to be realized anyway, nothing of the sort. What happens is that the great spiritual force, whose real name is the law of precipitation, is completely impersonal, and places its gifts in the most harmonious, most natural places. Always taking advantage of the channels already established, in your own life. It is not interested in exhibitionism or surprise, it only fulfills its task of giving you what you ask for, where it best suits you. Ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and it will be opened to you, Matthew 7 verse 7. The reason, why there are several lessons from Emmett Fox in this booklet, is because it has been compiled, to help and get you out of trouble as quickly as possible. And Dr. Fox, my teacher, has been and still is, although his subject is no longer with us, a specialist in the art of getting people out of trouble. The above article, I wrote it so that you can achieve all that you desire, in a minimum of time. This is done to alleviate any condition, that is being unbearable. Dr. Fox says, I have reduced this essay as much as possible, although I would have liked to reduce it to a few lines. It is not an instructive work, 
but a formula to get you out of calamities. Study is all right in its own place and time, but it does not straighten you out of difficulties. It is only the work, of raising and transforming your consciousness of things, that solves a problem for you on the outside. Read often the master key. Do what it indicates, and if you have persistence, you will find yourself mastering every difficulty. The scientific prayer, will get you out of any existing difficulty. It is the master key to harmony and happiness. To all those who do not know the greatest power of the universe, I recommend that you try what I expose here, to obtain the results that God affirmed. God is omnipotent, and man is his image and likeness, with dominion over all things. This says the spiritual doctrine, and it is to be taken seriously. It is not the prerogative of the saint or the mystic, it is for all humans, whoever you are, wherever you are. The master key to harmony, is in your hands now. This implies that scientific prayer, is an act performed by God, and not by you. Your only task is to stand back, and allow God to act through you. You wish to be a simple conduit, hence your imperfections and limitations, do not interfere with the results. No matter what your religion is, God is God. You are His child, and that is enough for Him. Now, for the way to work, when you find yourself in a difficulty, try not to keep thinking about the problem, and think about God. Replace the problem, by thinking about God. It doesn't matter if it is something very big or very small. What really matters, is that you stop thinking about it, and think about God. It doesn't matter what concepts you have about God, whether it is His power, omnipresence, love, wisdom or intelligence. It doesn't matter if you know Him well, rethink it and reflect every time, that the thought of the problem comes up again. Don't get tense, or try to guess what is going to happen, or how God is going to fix it. Leave it to Him, put His hands on it, as we say in metaphysics, and forget it. You have entrusted your problem to the greatest, wisest, most skilled specialist, and you know He will solve it, in perfect harmony for the good of all, and to your entire satisfaction. However, do not get in His way, do not interfere with your human personality. In other words, don't screw up, as we would say colloquially. The right way to pray, the spiritual treatment, is to raise the mind to a consciousness above the level of the problem. If you can raise your thoughts high enough, the problem will solve itself. In fact, that is your only problem, to raise your thinking. The more difficult the problem, which implies that it is more deeply rooted in your subconscious, the higher you must raise your consciousness. A minor annoyance will yield to a small elevation, while a serious problem will require a major elevation. And if it is a great danger or a desperate situation, you will need more spiritual work to deal with it. But that is the only difference. Don't try to solve your problems, mixing your thoughts with the thoughts of others, and trying to compose them that way. It does not work. Raise your consciousness, and God's action will do everything. This means, that you must remember the truth of your being, the truth of God, and the truth of the spiritual plane. That is, you must explore what the conditions are like in spirit, what your higher self is like. It is perfect at this moment, flawless. There is no death, disease, poverty, strife, enmity, war, ugliness, or evil. By visualizing the opposite condition, the one you are observing in the material, that condition becomes the truth. Jesus healed the sick, calmed the storms and raised the dead, because he could raise your consciousness, as far as necessary to do so. To raise your consciousness, you must turn your attention away from the material picture momentarily, and then gently concentrate, on the picture that represents spiritual truth. You can do this by stopping thinking about the problem, reading one of your metaphysical books, reciting affirmations, not like a parrot, but meditating on them. You can also do it by having a conversation, with one of your teachers or fellow advanced disciples. I know people, who have achieved elevation of consciousness, by browsing and rereading parts of the Bible, because the law of attraction will direct you to the Bible, 
where it corresponds to your problem. One man, saved himself in the sinking of a great ocean liner, by repeating, God is love, getting to understand something, of the meaning of this great affirmation. It is also possible to employ all these methods simultaneously, as long as you do not allow tension to take hold of you. No matter how you approach a problem, the essential thing is to transcend the plane of difficulty, and concentrate on God. In business, whether they are sales, contracts or other, are mediations between people, which must be satisfactory to both parties. They are agreements between individuals. Whether you are looking for a job, or looking for a person with certain suitable conditions, it is equivalent, as Dr. Fox says, to seek and find God, on both sides of the problem. That is, both in the person seeking, and in the person offering. God himself is handling the issue. God cannot be divided to antagonize, so there must be a point of harmony, where the two persons meet. God himself, seeks to satisfy himself in each of his children. Do not try to impose your will, affirm that it is the will of God, which is being fulfilled on both sides. Expose your part with all simplicity, forget the habit of expecting that the other is trying to take advantage. Remember that God is also within him, and you will see that he proceeds with complete justice. Neither try to persuade him in an exaggerated manner, nor try to convince him against his will. Remember that if you do not get this sale, job or employee, it simply means that there is something better for you. Don't worry or rush, God is never in a hurry. He works effortlessly on the spiritual plane, and everything comes with great harmony. Do not forget the magic formula, according to the will of God, in the name of Jesus Christ, in harmony for the whole world, under grace and in a perfect way. Thank you Father, that you have already heard me. The powerful verse, the formula to pray correctly, I am divine spirit in God, I live, I move and I have my being. I am already part of God's expression, and I express perfect harmony. I, as an individual, have omniscience. I have direct knowledge of truth, I have perfect intuition, I have spiritual perception. I know that God is my wisdom, so that I cannot err. God is my intelligence, I cannot think otherwise than correctly. There is no waste of time, for God is the only doer. God acts through me, so that I am always acting correctly, and there is no danger of my praying incorrectly. I think the right thing in the right way, at the right time. My work is always well done, because it is God's work. The Holy Spirit is always inspiring me. My thoughts are fresh, new, clear and powerful, in harmony with omnipotence. My prayers are crafted by the Holy Spirit, powerful as the eagle, and gentle as the dove. They go forth in the name of God Himself, and cannot return empty. They will accomplish what pleases me, and prosper in that to which they are directed. I thank God for this. This last thought is from Isaiah 55:11. The following four prayers are recommended by Dr. Emmett Fox. God is love. And he who dwells in love dwells in God and God in him. Love is the most important thing of all, it is the golden door to paradise. Ask for understanding of love, and meditate on it daily. It banishes fear, is the fulfillment of the whole law, covers a multitude of sins, and is absolutely invincible. There is no difficulty, which cannot be overcome through love. There is no disease, which is not cured by enough love. There is no door, which sufficient love will not open, nor abyss, which sufficient love will not bridge. There is no wall that enough love cannot break down, no sin that enough love cannot redeem. No matter how buried the error is, no matter how hopeless the outlook, no matter how big the error, no matter how tangled. If you can love enough, you will be the mightiest and happiest being on earth. The most powerful presence. Affirmative meditation, to achieve the elevation of consciousness. God is the only presence and the only power. God is fully present, here with me now. 
God is the only real presence, everything else is mere shadow. God is the perfect good, God is the cause of only perfect good. God never sends sickness, accident, temptation or death, nor does He authorize these things. God, the good, can cause nothing but good. The same fountain cannot produce sweet and bitter waters. I am the Divine Spirit, I am a child of God, in God I move, live and have my being, so that I do not fear. I am surrounded by the peace of God, and all is well. I do not fear people, I do not fear circumstances, I do not fear myself, for God is with me. The peace of God fills my soul, and fear cannot even touch me. I do not fear the past, I do not fear the present, I do not fear the future, for God is with me. The Eternal Father is my abode, and below are the everlasting arms. Nothing can ever touch me but the direct action of God Himself, and God is love. God is life, I understand this and I express it. God is truth, I understand this and I express it. God is divine love. I send thoughts of love, peace and health to the whole universe, to all trees, plants, and everything that grows, to all animals, birds, to every man, woman and child on earth, without distinction. If anyone has harmed me or done me any wrong, I forgive him voluntarily and completely, now and all matter is over forever. I let go and let them go. I am free and they are free. If there is any resentment left in me, I commit it to my inner Christ, and I am free. God is infinite wisdom, and that wisdom is mine. This wisdom guides and directs me so that I cannot make mistakes. Christ in me is the lamp of my feet. God is infinite life, and that life is my providence and its minister. I can lack nothing, I can lack nothing, for God created me, and He sustains me. Divine love has foreseen everything, has provided everything. One single time, one single power, one single principle, one God, one element, is closer to me than my feet and my hands, than my own breath. I am Divine Spirit, I am the Son of God, and in His presence I live eternally. I thank the Father for perfect harmony. This invocation can be done in combination with the flames, when a student knows them. Treatment to develop divine love. My soul is filled with divine love, and I am surrounded by divine love. I radiate love and peace, to everyone. I am conscious of divine love. God is love, and there is nothing else in creation but God and His expression. All human beings are expressions of divine love, so that I cannot stumble upon anything other than expressions of divine love. All this is the truth now, this is the present state of things. I do not have to strive to make all this happen, I observe it in this moment. Divine love is the nature of being, and there is nothing but divine love in the nature of being. There is nothing but divine love and I know it. I understand perfectly, what divine love is. I have conscious realization of divine love. The love of God burns in me, towards all mankind. I am a focus of God, radiating divine love to everyone I meet, to everyone I think of. I forgive everything, everything that needs my forgiveness, absolutely everything. Divine love fills my heart, and everything is perfect now. I radiate love to the whole universe, without exception to anyone. I experience divine love, I manifest divine love. I thank God for this. The two keys to hell are criticism and resentment, commonly called rancor. These can be permanently destroyed by the above treatment. When the student knows the flames, he can do this treatment by applying the pink flame. Love is not limited to feeling affection for another. Love has many ways of manifesting itself, and one of the greatest is to express the desire to forgive, and to send good to others. To seek to know God is to love Him, to try to purify one's thoughts is to love God, to try to correct unpleasant concepts is to love one's neighbor for whom one feels displeasure. 
To enjoy beauty and art is love, love for God. There is no fear in love, love destroys fear. Fear has torment, for he who fears, has not yet been perfected in love. John 1, 4 18. These are the 15 points, to know if I am really on the path. 1. If I always look for the good in every situation, person and thing. 2. If I resolutely turn my back on the past, whether good or bad, and live only in the present and the future. 3. If I forgive everyone without exception, no matter what they have done, and then forgive myself, wholeheartedly. 4. If I consider my work or daily task, as a sacred thing, trying to fulfill it to the best of my ability, whether I like it or not. 5. If I do everything in my power, to manifest a healthy body, and a harmonious environment in my surroundings. 6. If I try to render service to all others, without doing so in a majestic and fastidious manner. 7. If I take every opportunity to make the truth known to others in a wise and discreet manner. 8. If I staunchly avoid criticism, refusing to listen to it or support it. 9. If I devote at least a quarter of an hour to meditation and prayer. 10. If I read at least seven verses of the Bible, or a chapter of some instructive book, on the truth for this age. 11. If I make a special treatment daily, to ask for or demonstrate understanding. 12. If I train myself to give my first thought to God, after waking up. 13. If I utter the verb for the whole world every day, either in our daily exercises, or especially at 12 o'clock in the day. 14. If I practice the golden rule of Jesus, instead of merely admiring it. He said, Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The important thing about the golden rule is that we should practice it, even if others do not practice it towards us. But there is also a rule that does not have its opposite, so that you do not allow others to do to you what you would be unable to do to them. 15. If I fully realize that what I see is nothing but a mirage, it is possible to transform it by means of scientific prayer in order to demonstrate harmony and perfection in everything in your life. Ask yourself once a week if you are fulfilling all these points. My world contains everything. How many times have you found yourself missing something to continue what you are doing? If you are dressing, are you missing a pin or a needle and thread? If you are at work, are you missing a pen or some other instrument? You are seeing a material appearance, nothing more. The truth is always in the spirit, as you well know. When you think and look for the correspondence in the spiritual, that is, when you think how the situation is on the spiritual plane, Timendi always tells you that it is perfect, so meditate. What would be perfection in this case? Perfection, in the case that you are getting dressed, and you are missing a pin or a needle with thread, would be that you have at that moment what you are missing, or that you have no need of those items. Right? Well, you have already seen that your body is made of the substances of the plane, that the habitat contains all the elements that can be found in all other objects, items, etc., that are on the planet. In addition, you have been accumulating in all your past lives, everything you may need and use, each experience with all the necessary accessories, to see it fulfilled and overcome. They are already in your etheric body as memory, and in your causal body, as constructive assets. You have then full authority to declare, my world contains everything, and it is not possible that at any time it should lack anything. Spiritually, what I need is with me, and I claim it in material appearance, because I lack it for my matter at this moment. You will see a small miracle, if you have understood well the principle I have explained to you. You will find a pin or a needle with thread, almost without looking for them. Or it will come to your mind immediately, the thing that can make up for the lack, in the case that one of you asks me the question that others have asked, what would happen if I were in a desert and I lacked water, for example, and I could not find it? I answer that once you know this law, this principle, 
and you apply it two or three times, there will never again be a case in your existence in which you will lack absolutely nothing of what you may need. This case of the desert without water is karmic, it is an experience that was necessary at a given moment. But you are already learning such advanced spiritual laws as these, you have already passed the experience of the desert, you have overcome it, and the case will never happen again. The step taken has been overcome, and there is no need to take it again. The cuckoo, it is something you know, isn't it? In Venezuela, the cuckoo is the monster they scare the children with, in order to make them behave well. Dr. Fox says, this article is for people who have a concern. I never scold anyone who is worried, because that is tantamount to kicking the fallen one. Does a person worry because it amuses them? Of course not. There are people, who take pleasure in acting in that whiny manner. That is a condition that needs urgent attention, but it is not a case of worry. Worry is a hell, from which the victim feels great relief, at the slightest sign of escape, and you can actually avoid worry. It depends on whether or not you understand the truth of being. If you do understand it, the answer is yes. Consider the following, that which you do not believe in has no power to bother or worry you. The boogeyman of your childhood no longer scares or deceives you, because you no longer believe in it. But when you were three years old, it had the power to make your heart race, to make your cheeks turn white, to make your knees tremble, to make you throw up all your food. To make you vomit up all the food in your stomach, which under special conditions, could have killed you. However, today it doesn't even make you blink, because you don't believe in it anymore. That's all, nothing has really changed. There is no such boogeyman, nor has there ever been. The only difference lies in yourself, you have changed your way of thinking, you discovered that it was a falsehood, and you are free now. Exactly the same is true of any other form of evil that is manifesting in your experience, for all evil is a boogeyman, and nothing else. It is happening to you because you believe in it, and it will vanish the moment you stop believing in it. The only life that keeps it alive, is given to it by you, with your belief in it. Any situation, and even any material object, can be changed by spiritual treatment, or what we call, scientific prayer. No matter what is going to happen tomorrow, something very different will happen because of scientific prayer. A dislocated ankle, the consequences of having stained a suit with ink, the court trial that happened last week, the operation you are going to have next week, and all the consequences that may arise therefrom. Everything can be totally erased from everyone's consciousness, or the character of all these things can be changed to make them appear to be blessings to all concerned. Sometimes it happens that you buy an article, and when you get home, you realize that it was not what was right for you, and you think it is too late. No matter, treat the case scientifically, and you will see that after all, the purchase was correct, and you will rejoice with the acquisition. Or in some other way, you will have satisfaction for having bought it, as everything becomes good, by treating it by scientific prayer. All this is the truth, so this proves that the material plane is not real, in the sense of being fixed or permanent, and once we grasp this truth, it no longer has power to bother us. The truth is that our material conditions are nothing but the outward reflection of the convictions we hold in our minds. And since we have the power to change these convictions, it is evident that we can change the outer reflections as well. Your problem at this moment is exactly like the boogeyman of your childhood. It is the boogeyman, and the only power it has is the power you are giving it by believing in it. And the way to do that, is to pray enough scientifically, or get someone to help you. You will see that unhappy picture transform into something totally different, or disappear completely. With enough prayer, you can get it erased from your memory. But that won't be necessary, because you won't want to forget the boogeyman. It doesn't matter, you see, because it is possible to remove the worry, when you can say to yourself. Yes at this moment this seems like a calamity, although I know that with a good treatment, I can change this situation into something totally different. You can already say, 
that worries end for you, and it is only a matter of time for health, harmony, and prosperity, to be permanent in your life. Says the Bible, the name of the Lord is a strong tower, the right thinker enters it, and is safe. Master Fillmore, founder of Unity, says, it is no crime to be rich, and there is no virtue in being poor, as the reformers have led us to believe. The evil consists in hoarding money, preventing it from circulating freely, and reaching him who needs it. Those who put their wealth to work, in such a way as to contribute to the welfare of the masses, are instrumental in the salvation of this country. If everyone had, what we call the consciousness of poverty, misery would be general, as it is in India and China. In those countries, the millions of inhabitants, are permanently tied to the thought of their poverty, and suffer scarcity in all its forms, from the cradle to the grave. The burden of poor thinking falls on the land, and year after year it withholds its produce, so that thousands starve to death. The consciousness of prosperity, must first be formed. All the old and false ideas of scarcity, restriction and dependence on fixed channels must be denied. The idea that something is too expensive, comes from the state of our purse. We compare the cost with the amount we have, and we instantly decide whether we can afford it or not. If our assets are limited, the object seems expensive to us, if our assets are large, we do not give any importance to the cost, and we acquire it. The object is not that it is expensive, but that the consciousness is poor. You may be thinking, however, that there are things for which merchants ask too much. But I tell you again, if you had many millions to spend, it would not even occur to you to think, whether the merchant is asking too much or not. Therefore, it is not the shortage, but the state of your purse, and this depends on the state of your conscience. Since you were a child, perhaps you heard at home the subject of money, the cost, and what you could or could not acquire. Few can boast that when they were small, they asked to buy something for them, and that their parents did not answer, today you cannot, because there is no money. Thus he immediately assumed the character of the monster that denies everything. The monster that interrupts everything, that spoils everything, that enjoys seeing us deprived and sighing, until we end up bending our heads, resigned to fatality. How few can say that their parents answered, Let's think that God wants to give it to us, and that He is only waiting for the moment to surprise us. This is the concept that I want you to internalize today, to recite it in your mind or out loud, every time you experience a desire or a need. And that you use it to contrast what you have in your pockets, with the cost of what you long for. Let's think that God wants to give it to us, and that He is just waiting for the moment to give us the surprise. You already know that the truth, is that in the spirit everything is already given, granted and waiting for us to claim it. And that is why we teach to give thanks before it appears. But this idea insists on eluding the subconscious. The subconscious has no capacity to discern the power of, your word is law, what you pronounce, what you visualize in your mind, the image you create. They are mandates that the subconscious must fulfill, with the utmost precision and speed. The only thing that shakes it is the voice of the higher self. The high vibrations of truth, crumble the petrified, crystallized, we say in the subconscious, and it would cost years of psychoanalysis, to get to discover them. And yet, the psychoanalyst will tell you that if it is not replaced with something, the nail he has just pulled out, relapses back into the same evil. This is why metaphysics first denies the evil, then affirms the truth, to go replacing what is being erased by the highest and most powerful, the truth that will never have to be erased. The simple affirmation that I gave you, so that you could learn it by heart, contains a triple intention. The first is that you form the idea that everything comes from God, that is to say, from the divine substance, and that these ideas of the fixed channels are removed. Your fixed channels are either the salary you receive or the organization where you work. And if you have no need to work, your fixed channels are either your father's business, or your spouse's business, or the farms that produce your income. In short, whatever provides you with the sum of money, 
with which you make your expenses. And the whole race is accustomed to think that if these were to fail, it would cause ruin. Very few realize that the channels of prosperity and abundance are really infinite, because they are from God, and they are God. They ignore what you already know, that all happiness comes already equipped with the material required to fill it. That is to say, that as they say in metaphysics, supply and demand are one on earth, they are two opposite things in truth, they are one and the same thing. The second intention of the statement that I taught you is that you get used to the fact that God's will is magnanimous, that God wants you to have precisely what you are needing and desiring. Because the desire and the need for something, are produced at the moment, in which you are preparing to enjoy it or take advantage of it, not a minute before or a minute after. And if you have been longing or feeling the lack of something for years, that time has the same years knocking at your door, so that you just receive it. And it is the subconscious, which is rejecting it and making you wait, to fulfill the order you gave him to accept you, the idea that it would be impossible to realize your desire either because you consider it too costly, prohibitive or too difficult. The Bible explains this in the following way, and I have already repeated it many times, every place where you place the sole of your foot belongs to you. The feet are symbols of understanding, and the earth is a symbol of manifestation. So, the translation of this phrase is, any manifestation that you can conceive of, whether it is of age or anything else, is something that no one can take away from us, it is ours by right. The third intention that carries the statement that I showed you, is in the phrase, it is just waiting for the moment to give us the surprise. Often students, who do not have a demonstration as quickly as they expected, come to complain to me, almost blaming me of unfulfilled, as if I had promised them something that I have not given them. This is a childish attitude, it is a hangover of bad parenting left over, from when they were children in their parents' home, and proof that they were spoiled children, who were never denied their slightest whim. The demonstration is always ready to appear, just waiting for the right moment. There are an infinity of reasons that obstruct the exit, and that destroy the opportune moment, and the manifestation has to wait, that there is another indicated moment. One of the most common and common reasons is the inconsistency or lack of firmness. Once the treatment has been thought, invoked, claimed and done, either the student feels doubts, or is tempted to go out and talk about it, or expresses with his words, concepts that deny the truth that the treatment declares. All this is very natural, we should not get impatient with ourselves, nor with the delay of the demonstration. We are not perfect and we are learning to be. The subconscious is not to blame for being heavy and flattened, in old ideas and habits. Another very common defect is to think that we have to keep repeating the treatment in order to get it done. This is the equivalent of continually opening the oven to turn over a baking cake with a spoon. A treatment is done only once, as excellently as possible. The truth is seen and declared. Then thanks are given and left, and farewell the realization. When the thought comes to mind, the thought of that which we are in need of, and which has not yet been realized, we do what Emmett Fox called, give a treatment to the treatment. In other words, you should say, I have already done the treatment, and I have no need to worry or worry. Thank you Father. You can give infinite thanks, as many times as you want. It reaffirms the demonstration itself, and it is rejoicing. Rejoice, and give thanks to God in everything. When you give someone a gift as a surprise, or when they give you a surprise, it is a surprise. Even when you have been longing for something, and someone gives it to you, it surprises you and makes you happy. The phrase of the treatment, puts you to expect the surprise that God is going to send you, at the time when you least expect it, and this enthusiastic expectation, is the faith that moves mountains. Do not confuse it with hope. Hope is a poor sister of faith. Says Emmett Fox, hope, that anguish mixed with doubt, is joyful expectation. Hope and faith are two very different things. How different it is to say, I have hope, to say, I have faith. 
It has come to my attention that at least two of my students are lacking money. You can be very advanced spiritually, and have no prosperity consciousness, just as you can have a great prosperity consciousness, and not be spiritual at all. This is that one aspect of life has been developed, and the other has not been touched. When you are manifesting a lack of abundance, you have to work on that aspect. You have to meditate a lot on abundance. I said to one of my disciples in these days, wherever man does not touch with his thought of scarcity, abundance is manifested. In terms of waste, in the jungles, in the ordinary mountain, if we do not live cutting the grass in the garden, it piles up until it covers the house, because we spend our time thinking precisely that we have to live cutting it. In the forests, there is no one who thinks, nothing grows here. There is no one who pours poison to kill it. There is no one who thinks, what a summer, the bushes are going to dry up and it is not going to rain. Master Fillmore continues, saying, the anxious thought has to be eliminated, and we must adopt the perfect abandonment of nature. And when to this attitude is added the realization that one possesses unlimited resources, the divine law of prosperity will have been fulfilled. To achieve this attitude of abandonment of all preoccupation, one must meditate on the divine abundance manifested. It is necessary to examine oneself, to see where one is unconsciously putting a break on prosperity and abundance. It is necessary to affirm with all the evidence, that we are children heirs of all that the Father possesses, and that not only He can manifest riches and satisfactions, but that all humanity wishes us the same. That no one wants to deprive us and style us, because all mankind contains God, and God is not divided into two. To disharmonize with the same, there is a way to produce what remedies an immediate need. It serves us to produce constant abundance, but it produces what fills the gap of the moment. It is to make a mental picture made of pure imagination, and see yourself filling your wallet, depositing in the bank, distributing and feeling the satisfaction of being able to give, and make others happy. But you have to do it, even by feeling with your fingers the grain of the paper, the rustle of the bills, the weight of the coins, and so on. This practice should be repeated abundantly, so that the subconscious internalizes and reflects it. It is not necessary to inquire about how the medium will materialize. It is enough to communicate it to God. The latter is perhaps the most valuable thing, especially when the funds are exhausted. It will come, that is to say, the confirmation that the divine channels, are infinite and unpredictable. Do not forget to insist, that the next step you face, come under grace and in a perfect way. If you have found delight in everything shared in this teaching for the new era, if in its reading you have exclaimed several times, this was to be expected, it is so obvious. Then I could affirm that I possess an innate inclination towards metaphysics, since I practice many of these techniques. So, go deep and immerse yourself through all the other religions and faiths present on the planet. Throughout your previous lives, you have accumulated a diversity of practices and theories. The enriching is in your causal body, which corresponds to the aura of your higher self. The destructive is in your lower vehicles, the physical body or emotional body, the etheric body and the mental body. But above all, in your etheric body is all the memory of everything that has happened to you in all your lives, and nothing is lost. Write this down very well, nothing is lost. So, if you are attracted to the metaphysical teachings, if you understand and absorb them, it is because you are ready to go up a step. If you do not accept them, if you do not understand them, if they do not attract you, if they rather repel you, it means that you cannot digest them yet. You have to stay in another type of belief, a lesser one, where the principle of mentalism is not practiced. In some of them you will find it explained superficially, but without being given the utmost importance. All these sects and doctrines have things that you instinctively long for. They will give them to you, and they will also give you a wealth of knowledge, which will fill your mouth, your mind and your satisfaction. They will also impose on you numerous rites, rituals, physical practices, prohibitions, diets, 
ties, all of which can be enclosed in one word, limitations. But you need them, that is your present step. We don't want to denigrate, diminish or discredit any doctrine. It is not because a little brother is a child that he is seen as inferior. We only want to reassure you about the step in which you are now, the how and the why. We know that metaphysics is the last teaching sent to the planet by the masters of wisdom by many signs. Let's start at the beginning. No other doctrine will teach you how to solve your problems. The master key of mind, to manifest everything you desire. To transform the unattainable into the possible. The cuckoo does not teach you to carry with such sweetness and harmony, your business to triumph. When we come to this reincarnation, we erase all the knowledge acquired in other lives, because Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The knowledge fills with intellectual pride, those who are already prepared, to enter into spiritual studies. In the new age, they are lazy in schools during their childhood, and unwilling to undertake intellectual studies, when they are already older. A step taken should not be taken again. If you feel the desire to accumulate knowledge, it is because you failed to do so in the previous life. The new era is the era of liberation. In this era, the complicated rites will end, the thousands of trifles, which take time for better things, more interesting. Thus, when at the time of the Temple of Jerusalem, the prevailing religion ordered that each Levite, had to comply with more than 600 religious details, rituals and requirements daily. Dr. Fox, says that the poor lived under a consciousness of ineptitude, slavery, sin. For according to the creative principle, or law of mentalism, to feel and consider oneself a sinner, is in fact to be in sin. Not being possible to comply with such rigor, they were punished mercilessly. If the directors of sex and religions that you practice, manifest diseases, misery, pain, sorrow, sadness, calamities, and so on, you will know that these fruits, are the product of minds of errors and falsehoods. For Jesus said, By their fruits you shall know them. Do not continue to listen to those who have nothing to teach you. You are more advanced than them. Later, in your study of metaphysics, you will learn to burn your karma, and that of others too, without pain, without suffering, applying the divine and wonderful violet flame of liberation by love. This is the gift of the Ascended Master Saint Germain. Advance of the New Age. And by then, you will be able to invoke from your own causal body, all the knowledge and abilities, which are yours by right of conscience, and that you have accumulated. For the moment, you can already practice this formula, I am the divine wisdom of God, He knows everything. Continue with the affirmation, entitled, The Mighty Word, which you have already read above. The practice of the presence of God, which is what these studies are really called, cleanses and unbinds you, leads you and instructs you, almost without the need of books. Jesus said, The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send you in my name, will teach you all things. He frees you from an infinite number of limitations, which you previously thought it was your duty to fulfill. And one of the greatest liberations that will come to you, is that you will know how to heal at a distance, and solve the problems of others also at a distance. You will no longer have those problems, which frees you from working in the material, as others have to do, not having the divine resource that you have. And many times, you will see situations transform with your presence alone, because it is your state of spiritual consciousness and divine consciousness, which radiates. Television, on the other hand, emits low vibrational frequencies, in your environment and mind, that belong to others. Understand that it is the consciousness that you have, that in you and in your neighbor, is the presence of God, who is the Christ. I have always taught you that the Christ is our truth, the truth of each one, perfect and almighty. It is the noblest of every being. Now we are going to break it down, so that you can understand it better. You already know that everything has life. That which has life, hears, feels and responds. Something that is dead or asleep does not hear me, 
nor does it feel or respond. Remember that. Life is the capacity to hear, feel and respond, answer or react. Let's draw several planes. First, let's put life here. Every living thing or thing that has awakened to life, first of all, has life. Now comes the question, what kind of life, elemental or earthly? If it is elemental, it will be air, water or fire. If it is earthly, will it be born as mineral, vegetable, animal or human? Once this has been defined, then comes individuality. All is one, and they are individuals. Each shows a facet or special talents, virtues or attributes, which are not common to all. In humans, for example, what aspect does he present? Does he have black or white skin? Blue or black eyes? What peculiarity does he manifest? And if there is such an infinite variety of classes, aspects, virtues, peculiarities, talents, types, races, kingdoms, etc., why is it said that all these are one and the same being? First of all, we know that everything, absolutely everything, comes from the same source, that which we call God. Therefore, everything is not only a son of God, but the son of God, because there is no exact repetition. Everything is individual. But in that infinite variety, there is something that betrays sonship, brotherhood, equality. There must be something that is exact in everyone, a kind of trademark that marks the kinship, the filiation, something in the shape of the nose, in the ears, in the speech, something that identifies us all as relatives of God. And that something is three things, conscience, intelligence and love. Every living being has conscience, intelligence and love. No one is so bad that he does not love, even if it is his mother or his dog. No one who is alive, fails to manifest it in some way. Whether his heart is beating or breathing, something is conscious in him, something responds, something feels, something hears. It is alive, it already has consciousness. And this is symbolized by three primary colors, blue, yellow and red. Everything, absolutely everything, has these three colors. Everything has consciousness or life, or what is the same, will, and that is blue. Everything has intelligence, which is represented by yellow. Everything has attraction and repulsion, adhesion and cohesion, that is, love, red. Everything has these colors, in all realms of creation. Human ears are dull. The finest being of ear, is not able to hear his cells. No one realizes, therefore, that the invisible planes, astral and etheric, are a din of sounds, voices. It is a shouting of everything that has life. We have said that everything that has life hears, feels and responds. The human body, being solid, solid, does not support this din. I pray that when you awaken in your spiritual senses, you will not find yourselves alone. May you be accompanied, and the best company is that of the Christ, that is, the higher self, who is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-mastering. It is infinite comfort, infinite love and tenderness. Now, who is the Christ? It is the expression of these three conditions, consciousness, intelligence, and love, in their highest degrees. It is love in its purest degree, it is His will, most pure, that of God Himself. It is the highest intelligence, like God Himself. It is the essence of divinity. It is all that we are, but on the highest, purest, noblest, noblest, good and perfect scale. It is the essence of truth. It is the pattern and design, of God's will for us. Every day, we should meditate on this. By thinking about it, we plug ourselves, so to speak, on the Christic plane. We keep thinking about it. After 20 seconds, we experience a step, a step, and we feel closer. At the next 20 seconds, we feel it, or begin to feel it, as a sweetness that lifts us up. By the third 20 seconds, we feel happy, we know that we love Him, and that He loves us. 
If we do this every day, we will become more like the divine design. Every day we become more good, more pure, beautiful, intelligent, alive and alert. But remember also, he has a voice and an ear. It is not the same as the voice of our body. He is a being united and apart at the same time, who is united to us, and apart from us. Therefore, we can speak to him, and we know that he answers us. I hope you have made some progress, in understanding the Christ within. Because I want everyone to burn the ancient card, which is crystallized. And this is burned by the Christ, whom Emmett Fox called, the Lord of Karma. There is the cosmic Christ, and the individual Christ. That is, the glorious divine being within our hearts, made of universal light, and created by God the Father and Mother. It develops as a seed, through millions of years of evolution in our consciousness. This Christ being is intelligent, is a living being in each of us, and is more interested in you than you are yourself. For millions of years, it has been giving you even breath, and has been sustaining you, in the hope of achieving an opportunity, to externalize the divine blueprint, which you have on the plane of creation. Accept this now, and allow this God, through you, to fulfill his own pattern of perfection, his mastery and dignity, his balance and beauty, his harmony and freedom. Let us together make the following affirmation, I accept now the truth, that I possess a glorious divine being, who at this moment, is unfolding and bringing into my life and my senses, the realization of my own divinity. I affirm that I have in the center of my head, a chakra ganglion called faith, which generates and produces all the faith that is necessary for me. So, I can never again say that my faith is insufficient. If I have God in me, if my whole being is made of the essence of God Himself, of the body of God Himself, my father and mother, I have in my being all the qualities, and all the attributes of God Himself. Thank you Father, for this is the truth. There is but one power in the universe. Accept now, that the presence of God in your heart, is closer than your feet and your hands, closer than the breath that comes through your nose. Because it is your own life, which makes the heart beat. That presence of God, which is called, I am, is one and indivisible, with the beating of your heart. Place your hand on your chest when you address him, and invoke his exquisite presence to guide your meditation. Life is one of the aspects of God, or that which we call God. God is life, among so many other things. God is our life, and the life of all that exists. All life is one, yours, mine, that of the plant, the insect, the bird, and so on. It belongs to us individually. It is an immense life, in which we are floating, and we are each one a sponge, in an ocean of life. We are accustomed to think that each one of us in isolation possesses a quantity of life, and that it is like water in a reservoir surrounded by earth. It evaporates and dries up, and something dirty may fall into it, or something may infect or contaminate it. Absolutely nothing can happen to this immense, inexhaustible and indestructible spring. It cannot die, it is a stream of energy that flows through us, that penetrates us and that, therefore, keeps us alive. In other words, we are living beings, because we are in it. As the whole and critical race, the human being is a separate and isolated store of life, which is susceptible to disease, wear and tear over the years and death. The whole race manifests that belief. But when that opinion is erased, by dint of denying it and affirming the truth, they will cease to sicken, to grow old and to die. The more one thinks and meditates on the truth, the sooner the human being will be freed from these false beliefs. Because truth is cumulative. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free, Jesus said. And he also said, The kingdom of heaven, is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of flour, until it was all leavened. It could not be clearer. The kingdom of heaven is not what we have been offered for another plane, if we behave well. It is the state of bliss, harmony and advancement that we are seeking here. 
This meditation is clarifying something that you did not know, it is stirring up cells that were dormant, it is the leaven that Jesus refers to. This truth that you hear today, will continue to work in you, until one day, it will suddenly dawn on you like a sun, because it will have leavened all the dough. We have become so accustomed and hardened, by the routine of seeing each other, that the wonder that represents a person who speaks, thinks, moves, listens, and lives by himself. Without needing any wire connected to an electrical source, nor being rooted in the earth, does not amaze us in the least. And that other miracle that happens every minute, a child that, being separated from the mother who communicates its life to it, continues to live. And none of this attracts our attention, when it should provoke us to constant astonishment and contemplation. How is that possible? Or do you believe that this wonder, this miracle, is made by a cup of coffee with milk, food and eating? They are leftovers from the animal kingdom, they are animal instincts. As they do not think or react, they still do not have intuition, but instinct. They are still governed by that primitive cell, which was a stomach or rudimentary desire. They blindly obey the principle of generation and the law of evolution, which orders the combination of the elements and the gradual alteration of vibrations. Man is already thinking, rational and intuitive. His vibrations are intensified by thinking of higher things, by listening, understanding and accepting the truth of all things. It accelerates his frequency, and of course, he rises in plane. Meditation, as it is thinking deeply, and in a determined way on these higher concepts, advances the being rapidly. That is why I am having you meditate. We are children of God, made of His own substance. We are sponges in an ocean of life. We do not need external nourishment, when we are well steeped in this truth, and have understood it. We will find ourselves eating less and less automatically, without making any effort or sacrifice. The yeast of truth will have penetrated the whole mass, the cells of the body will be vibrating at high frequencies. Life is itself food, it is health, energy, beauty, it is life. Perhaps you have heard of Teresa Newman, the German woman who manifested all this in our era. She passed to the other plane a few years ago. I do not know the details of her passing, but they must be very interesting and significant. Although she was still imbued with rather dark concepts, one day she stopped eating and drinking, and so lived for about 45 years, until she left this plane. For several years, she was constantly watched by German government prosecutors, to verify this truth. I had to do the report for a magazine, and I had to investigate everything that was published about her. Her pictures were of a fat girl, full of health and energy. A farmer who milked cows, sowed and harvested crops, handling the pickaxe and the weeder, each time better. She had a very original demonstration. On Fridays of Holy Week, the wounds of Christ were opened in her hands and feet. Then he came to keep them forever. They did not become infected, and he never tasted a drop of water or a morsel of food again. The German government proved it. In the Bible, the words, drink and eat, mean, think and meditate. To drink or think, is the fluid, liquid thing, not to be chewed. Eating or meditating, is stopped, deeply chewed and digested. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood, has eternal life. I will raise him up on the last day, because my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood dwells in me, and I in him. This is the bread that came down from heaven. He who eats this bread shall live forever, for God is life, and the Son of God is that very life. To think and meditate on the truth of God, is to eat of that bread, is to appropriate that truth. To appropriate is to accept, to believe. You know that what one knows, one manifests. Meditate, then, on life in the terms I have given you. God is life, yours, mine, everyone's. We are sponges in an ocean of life. We are sponges in an ocean of life, 
and life does not need to be nourished from the outside. What could communicate life to life itself, if it is the giver of life? When a mother sees her child dying, or when a small child dies, or when a father or a mother disappears, leaving an entire family without support, someone comes, and for all consolation tells the sorrowful, this is a test sent by God. We must resign ourselves to the will of the Father. You know that these things, which indicate faith in evil and belief in a cruel God, are invented by the minds of men. First of all, you already know that death does not exist, we are only changing our way of living. It is only one of the thousands of changes that human beings make in the process of their evolution. When the family grows, the house becomes small and they move to a bigger one. When a pair of shoes becomes unusable, they are left and new ones are used. That house and those shoes have already fulfilled their mission, and this is death, the end of a mission. You will not tell me that a child dies because he becomes useless, or because he has learned what he came to learn. You will not tell me that a young man of 24 years old is used, worn out, old and useless. Now it is that the submission to God's will begins, it is that the human being finishes fulfilling his mission, and that he arrives to term enjoying all his faculties, strong and healthy. Neither God nor man has any advantage, that one wastes a large part of his stay on earth, being deaf, blind, ugly, in that unnecessarily unpleasant state, which is called old age. God also does not want the purpose of a life to be truncated, interrupted or wasted. You may have noticed that when a very old person dies, no one sinks into despair. That death produces nothing but a sweet, affectionate emotion, accompanied even by a tender smile. The children of the departed have their lives overflowing with their own interests. They hardly feel nostalgia for the old man or old woman, and when they finish burying him or her, everyone resumes their lives without much commotion. That is the ideal, the will of God, that the loved ones separate without any tearing apart, without a feeling of terrible emptiness. And that only pleasant memories remain, as well as certain contentment, that the departed one has moved on to a better life. Instead of wasting power and energy, fearing the death of a son, a mother or husband, and that is the surest way to see it happen, you have to spend that energy in saying. For I do not want any of my people to die, until I finish fulfilling their mission. God's will be done. Thank you Father, that you have heard me. And whenever the idea offers itself to the mind, say to it, No, thank you, I do not need you. I know the truth. As one who dismisses an unwelcome salesman, who comes to the door. This is the knowledge of the truth that liberates, this is what is called faith. Now you see why a being dies at the wrong time, and why he cannot die, if any of those around him have faith. If a metaphysician manages to enter the room of the sick person, the positive vibrations of his thoughts change the negative polarity that prevails in the room. Because the light always dominates the darkness, because the positive dominates the negative, because the good dominates the evil, because the truth distorts the lie. He knows that this life is precious, and that God does not want it to be cut short. The first thing he does is to remember the words that Jesus left us, All authority has been given to me, in heaven and on earth. And with the faith of one who knows the truth, he declares it, and the sick person is cured. You will ask what all beginners ask, what if he has an incurable disease, what if he has met with an accident which has damaged a vital organ? First of all, even religion has taught ad nauseum that nothing is impossible for God. This is to be taken seriously, I mean literally, that for the spiritual power, a destroyed organ or a so-called incurable disease, represent obstacles only for humans. They are less than nothing for life, it is indestructible, and it is foreseen that it will repair itself, if human minds do not close the way, with their false beliefs. The negative pole is also of God, everything is of God. God himself does not act against free will, and if you prefer to place yourself in the negative pole, you will have everything that belongs to him. To the positive pole belongs the smile, to the negative pole belongs the frown. 
If you want to change pole in full negative manifestation, smile, declare the present good, bless them. To the negative say, I don't want to see you, that's all, and you will see black transform into white, sad into happy, evil into good. Prove it in most of the miracles that Jesus did, he said to the patient, your faith has saved you, and he demonstrated it, destroyed organs or so-called incurable diseases, but dead, already dead in the tomb, so for faith, there is no such thing as impossible. The disciples ask Jesus the same question you sometimes ask, why did he not give me such and such a thing, when I did everything you told me to do? And he answered, because of your little faith. He never said that because he was the Son of God, and the others were not, but the opposite. He said, Ye are gods, and verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto that mountain, Pass from hence to yonder, and it shall pass away, and nothing shall come of it. And it will pass away, and nothing will be impossible. Nor did he scold anyone for not having faith, because he knew that faith, comes with knowledge. He explained to them why they could not do the miracles he did, and told them, All these things that I do, you know also, and greater things still. I do not know what other interpretation can be given to something so categorical and so clear. Jesus taught metaphysics, the proof is that everyone who studies metaphysics, also does miracles like Jesus. Now you will say that many times miracles are manifested to people who do not know a bit of metaphysics. Of course, it is only necessary to have faith, that faith that they call blind and that, nevertheless, produces results. It is simply that the patient places his thoughts in God, or in some entity, in a saint or in the Christ, or in the spiritual plane. And at the same time, he feels the trust he has placed in him, he trusts, his anxiety relaxes, he quiets down and waits. I have observed and listened, on countless occasions, to your protests, but I was absolutely sure, absolutely sure, that this act would give me results. And without hesitation, with tense muscles, expressing with total conviction to all who approach, that I am completely sure of healing. The difference is subtle, although I think you will have understood me. Whenever Jesus healed someone, he would say to him, Go away and tell no one. This was not out of modesty, but because it was part of the technique. The chick does not burst its shell until it is complete, feathers and all. You don't take a jelly out of its mold until it is firm. As below is above, every creation goes through seven stages before manifesting itself outwardly. These stages are sometimes passed through in a hundredth of a second, depending on the spiritual power of the one who executes them. If his understanding and his foundations are great, as in Jesus, the manifestation is instantaneous, and it means that the seven stages happened with atomic speed. But if you are only a beginner in spiritual science, the stages sometimes take years to accomplish. Words are spoken thoughts, they are sound vibration. Through them, energy is dispersed, and in this case, the momentum of the manifestation is subtracted. Students or beginners should restrain the desire to comment on the treatments they are doing, the ones they are thinking of doing, and the ones they have just done, until the demonstration is very sure, very firm. In the ancient Hebrew, it was called the Shabbat, to the last creative stage, when a demonstration arises, and it is known that the work is finished. That word gave origin to our Sabbath. In the Bible, from Genesis to St. John, it says that on the Sabbath all work ceases. Creation, is described as having occurred in seven days, that is, the stages I mentioned above, and that on Shabbat, God rested from His work, that is, on the seventh day. Psychotherapy is discovering what metaphysics has always known, the relationship between the ideas of humans and their physical ailments. Even general medicine, so reluctant to know the mental spiritual, has come to see in the worries, the cause of ulcers and heart attacks. It will not take long to discover that resentments and remorse are crops that produce cancer. The repressed feelings for fear of sinning or offending, as well as the consciousness of guilt, cause paralysis, arthritis and allergies. 
Matter is the sponge, which absorbs everything that man does not want to come out. There is a type of feeling, which is too strong and violent, so that no human matter can withstand it, and it is what we call the, abstract negative. For example, the unbridled hatred of one race against another, of one nation against another, and so on. Sometimes it is vented by means of a war, and both sides are torn apart, impoverished. But in the meantime there is bad blood, which has to look for an outlet, which cannot materialize in the subtle and refined contexture, of the human body. For it belongs to a lower region, and that finds at last its asylum in lower forms, in the wild beasts, the lion, the tiger, the poisonous snakes, the poisonous insects, the harmful thorns of certain plants, as well as underground. Likewise, there are feelings and thoughts so high, so spiritual and beautiful, which also do not find forms in matter, because it is so gross in comparison. But they are always at the command of those who have created them. This is the abstract positive. It is incarnated with all the beauty it finds in snowflakes, with their geometric forms, in flowers, perfumes, etc., as far as the material vibration supports it. Now there is no human being somewhat advanced, who has not been enraptured, even once, before a landscape, a sunset, an evocative picture, a beautiful flower, a child, a beloved face, a poem, music, a color, a thought read. These emotions with their accompanying thoughts, are pure, without malice, disinterested, made of sensitivity in love. There is nothing on the physical plane that can embody them, yet they are creations of men, and they take living form, becoming powerful entities. We call these beautiful, luminous and powerful entities angels. There are human beings who possess legions of angels, who are in command of their owners and creators. This is what Jesus was referring to, when he said, Lay up for yourselves treasures in the heavens that do not fail, where the thief does not come, nor the moth destroys. Have you ever heard it said that the prayers of mothers, reach the throne of God? People consider this, it is just a poetic form, although it does not mean what it expresses. That is, when a mother's love is selfless, unselfish, she is producing angelic forms, and directing them to the object of her tenderness. When her affection is impregnated with fear and anguish, the form is no longer angelic, but distorted, and sometimes becomes diabolical, producing what she fears. The child becomes ill, suffers accidents, and also dies prematurely. Not knowing this, the mother believes that it is the will of God, and suffers resigned. Hence the human symbol of the mother, is Mary with her dead child in her arms, and the name Mary, means, bitter sea. None of this is necessary, it does not represent the truth. To protect whoever against our own concepts, and false promises, we metaphysicians make treatments, in the following terms. According to God's will, I do not want any of my loved ones to suffer illnesses, accidents, or to die before they have fulfilled their mission in this world. Therefore, we will not have to suffer in either them for my disappearance, nor me for theirs. That is the law of God, and I willingly conform to it. Thank you, Father, for your greatness. If you feel able to understand, your thinking to include others, other than your immediate family circle, it is better. From now on, you will never have to fear the pain of death, neither yours nor others. Usually, people reject violently and with terror, any idea of death. This is counterproductive. When the idea presents itself, that is, presents itself to the mind, all you have to do, is to tell it calmly but firmly, no, thank you, you are not necessary to me, I know the truth. And then, proceed to think of something else. The idea that comes like that, without provocation, is not yours, it is a foreign thought that floats in and out, or passes through you. For the erroneous interpretation of death is so widespread and so ancient that the whole race is paralyzed in that idea. This is why Jesus said, the last enemy to be conquered is death, that is, the idea of death. Nobody wants to die, they are afraid of it, and therefore they die before their time. 
life has been cut short by fear. From the 900 years that the patriarchs lived, to the 90 years that is the span of time lived today, rare are the cases of 100 years or more. These are those of placid temperament. We have the inviolable right to conserve all our faculties and organs intact, as long as we need them, and as long as we live in a physical body. They have to serve us to the maximum capacity, until the very moment we pass to the incorporeal plane. It is not true that we have to lose vehicles and instruments, as indispensable as teeth, hearing, sight, feet, hands, vital organs, in short, all the human equipment. This is an intelligent universe, and it would not be intelligent to manufacture an automobile without wheels, a television without a screen, a telephone without a voice, and so on. As below so above. From now on, every time your anatomy wants to manifest some flaw, as well as every time one of those closed ideas comes to you, a fear of losing or damaging some faculty, you will say politely but firmly, no, none of that, I don't want to. You exist for my convenience, to serve me, and God does not make an incomplete idea. Thank you, I don't need it. I have no use for such an absurd idea. This little scolding goes but to your own conscience, your subconscious, to which you gave in the past an order, which he is fulfilling. For matter has neither voice nor vote, it knows nothing, it is only a vehicle, a thing. Therefore, we should not despise any of the channels that the Divine Spirit provides us with. Medicine is a channel and a resource, provided for those who do not know the truth. If your faith has not yet been established, you must take advantage of all the advantages and all the weapons at hand. At the same time, as matter and spirit cannot be divorced, there are material elements that the spirit uses at a given time, as there are spiritual elements which matter receives with advantage. I mean there are vibrations which change the chemical order in a substance, and chemical substances which emanate a strictly physical process. You must obey it, it is an inspiration. The divine intelligence knows what it is doing. You will see how the spirit uses its material vehicles, that is sometimes amazing, but it shows us once again, that God is not, as has been believed, separate from his creation, but intimately linked and interpenetrating in it. Use all of God's channels. When you use a physical channel, say a doctor, a process, an aspirin pill or whatever, bless the channel. This way you increase the good it contains for you and others. In this way you will be practicing the presence of God, for God is good. Use your angels. You may have legions, and they are all there to serve you. Their nature is life, love and good. To everyone who wants to be protected, put an angel when you lie down to sleep. With an angel at every door and every window, you can never approach someone who carries negative intentions. If he succeeds, he will feel a sudden reluctance, and will move away quickly, because the powerful vibrations of good, dominate the vibrations of evil, as light illuminates the darkness. When you leave your house alone, surrounded by angels, place an angel next to the driver who takes you or your loved ones. This is love in action. Try it just once, and you will be forever convinced. With all this, you will have realized that death is nothing but a rebirth, a continuation of life. In closing, I want to bless you with this affirmation, there is only one presence in your life, only one power, God, the omnipotent good. Allopathic and Psychological Medicine For our purposes, although medicine has a great variety, of branches and ramifications, we will say that it has two major branches, the general and specialization. We will say that the general branch, studies strictly the human body, the anatomy and diseases, which are manifested in that anatomy. It is then, a study of normal matter in a healthy state, and of the abnormal states that manifest themselves, together with the medicines that cure them. Specialization, then, is limited to a single sector, such as, for example, psychotherapy. But notice that no allopathic doctor, which is the current medicine, when you consult him for a stomach ache, 
for example, never asks, if the patient is happy at home or at work. Or if he has mood disturbances, because of people around him, or if he has worries. Now is when we are beginning to understand that the stomach ulcer is produced by the problems that worry. Because there are problems that are not paid attention, and no doctor is interested in knowing, if the living conditions of a patient, are pleasant or not. And as we will see later, there are many diseases, which are nothing but discomfort and unhappiness, maladjustment with the environment in which one lives, dissatisfaction with an environmental situation. The psychologist and the psychiatrist do try to determine if the patient is reacting to an external condition. Then there are a number of diseases that are nothing else, but since no one goes to consult a psychiatrist, when he has a stomach ache, he does not find a solution. What happens as a rule, is that the doctor who is consulted, is limited to find out which of the food is not digested well, and opens a booklet containing the names of countless remedies, and what each one is for. From there he copies a prescription, or gives a sample. If the patient returns to continue prescribing, because the pain has not gone away, the doctor then says, this is colitis, or chronic appendicitis. He then advises the operation, of course, for appendicitis, and recommends a strict diet for colitis, so the patient remains the same. The patient is cured alone at last, and we will see why. In metaphysics we study the environment and the problems of the patient, and we know why many of the diseases are due. We know that colitis is psychosomatic, as well as the diseases of the liver, stomach and intestines, and that blood sugar is a very interesting and deep psychic complication. As we know that everything has its origin in the mind, we can also relate the external events, with the inner ones and vice versa. God made us to be happy and to be happy. A happy being is never sick, just as a sick being is never happy. You all know the fact that by interrupting the bad mood circuit with a smile, the liver is cured and the bile disappears. This is described in my book, entitled, Metaphysics Within Everyone's Reach, but let's remember it. When a person suffers a displeasure and frowns, as we say, this gesture, which is nothing but an externalized or acted thought, has a direct influence on the pineal gland, which is the gland of psychic and astral vision. From there down the bitter vibration, through the cerebrospinal fluid in the spinal column, then permeates the liver, embitters it, and forms bile, and that bile causes again, the expression of displeasure in the face. In addition, the bitter taste with which the person dawns, is a vicious circle very easy to cut. All you have to do is to feel happy. How do you make yourself feel happy? It is easy too, if you have the will. First of all, you have to smile, even if you don't feel like it. The first smile will undoubtedly be forced, with the corners of your mouth pointing downwards, but the second effort will be better. Now you have to begin to give thanks aloud, for everything you see that you own. From a match, the clothes, the furniture, the relatives, the sun if it is shining, the rain if it is falling. Everything, absolutely everything, represents a good in its proper time, and we would lack at a given time, if we did not have it. So thinking about this, it makes us want to give thanks. That's it, we are thinking of God, we feel gratitude, and this combination sweetens the liver, cuts the vicious circuit and cures the evil. If we all followed this practice, we would never be disturbed, neither our liver nor our life. When one feels very afflicted, to instantly cure the friction, one should immediately begin to declare, I bless the good in this situation. There is no more effective way to make all friction disappear, to prevent it from becoming a cause and effect of a greater evil, and to avoid karmic forms. As you know, blessing increases the good that is blessed, transforms evil into good, and is to see God where evil appears to be. It is the most perfect expression of faith. There is no evil, which can resist the blessing of good, which is hiding behind an appearance of evil. Try it, and you will see how evil is transformed into good, and every affliction is cured. 
colitis and intestinal ailments are nervous results of fears and conflicts that are being experienced in daily life, whether at home or at work. It would seem that the spiritual, logically, should automatically cure what is wrong, right? But if the person mixes his negative, pessimistic and painful thinking with his supplications, bye-bye. He is creating a nonsense, he is forming a wrong image of God. What he is forming is a lower case God, painful and punitive, but not of mercy. We have four lower bodies, the emotional body, the mental body, the etheric body and the physical body. The etheric body is the repository, of all the memories of all our lives. Of course, in past lives there are such great impressions, such outstanding or long-lasting experiences, that we will be greatly influenced by those impressions. Everything that happens to us, we perceive with the color of that experience, or that outstanding conviction. For example, I know a lady who spent many lives, and if not several, at least a very recent whole life, being deeply Catholic. In Victorian times, everything was melodrama, the novels, the comedies, and so on. She has brought, then, to this life, a deep-rooted habit of turning everything into melodrama, and everything religious into painful. For her, the figure of Christ is represented by the crucified, and the Mater Dolorosa at his feet. Even her laughter is with eyebrows in a circumflex accent, of course. Although she ardently desires to be happy, she cannot, because her etheric body inclines her towards pain. It is the case of one who enjoys pain, because it is where she feels more comfortable, more at home, more familiar. In addition to the deformed etheric body, she has a very large emotional body, very uncontrolled, which makes her excessively emotional. It will cost her a lot to accept the new metaphysical wave, which is aligning the four bodies in a single mold, to function in harmony and orderly. With regard to the sugar in the blood, or what is commonly called diabetes, as your mind goes through all those who suffer from this disease, you will remember that, as a general rule, all are of a sweet character. External conditions contrary to their mode of being, affect them greatly. At first, they are handicapped, they cannot indulge in protests, nor explode in anger, for that is contrary to their innate being. It would do them a lot of good if they could defend themselves with an explosion of words, although they are unable to do so because of their original gentleness. Then, that sweetness turns sour, accumulates, and has to be vented somewhere. Diabetic coma, is the inability to bear the burden of poison sweetness anymore, which manifests itself in higher than usual amounts, in the form of sugar. Once this vicious circle is formed, the body adopts this relative defense, of course, since this form of defense can also be lethal. The thing is that, due to the inability to react on the outside, it reacts at the expense of the inside, who absorbs the excess. I knew a psychoanalyst, who recommended to a patient, to always have at hand 20 china plates so that, when he had an upset, he would break them by throwing them against a wall. Undoubtedly, he did it so that the patient would not repress himself. He probably had a tendency to be introverted, but that could be a good remedy for diabetics. I will end by telling you about a case I had recently. I hired a girl to help me at home. The girl came with a medical diagnosis of chronic appendicitis. The operation was not urgent, but she had to be operated one day, the doctor said. Three days after being in my house, she had pain. I decided to check first, whether or not it was from the appendix, or if it was, as I suspected, a result of the environment of the house she had left. It was a house where peace did not reign, where nothing that was done was well done, because an old sick woman, kept a conflicting environment. The girl was in pain with vomiting, which is classic in the case of appendicitis, as it is also typical in cases of disgust. It could be one thing or another, but I was not going to be swayed by the diagnosis. I gave him three mints, and told him, suck one right now, in half an hour another one, and in the third half hour, you suck the third one. The pain disappeared, and I took the opportunity to explain. 
It is better that you do not repeat that pain, as I agreed with the lady who sent you to me, that if the pain was repeated, I would return you to her, and you would have to continue working where you were. Also, I give you the good news, that you do not have chronic appendicitis. What you have is a nervous pain, due to the constant discomfort you had. Since you have no troubles here, there is no reason for you to have that pain. Are you happy with me? Yes, ma'am. Are you at peace? I am. Do you have everything you want? I have it, thank you. Very well, then, that's the end of that pain. And so it was. I was inspired by Jose Gregorio Hernandez, to whom I entrusted this matter, since he is my protector. I told him that if it was necessary to operate, he would take care of it. As St. Paul says, pray without ceasing. What does that mean? If you do not have time for prayer, treatment and meditation, that is, if you do not devote time to God, then all your time will be taken up with problems and illnesses. This is a subtle way of telling you that all the time you devote to the spiritual will keep you free from your present worries. St. Paul says in his first epistle to the Thessalonians, Pray without ceasing. We know that he did not mean by this, that we spend our lives on our knees and praying the rosary. We know that every thought, every emotion and every word we utter is equivalent to the most sincere prayers, and it is the mental fear we hold that determines whether what happens to us is good or bad. All day and every day we are praying, whether positive or negative. Pray without ceasing, means that we must keep our mind and soul, vibrating on an elevated plane. As you all know, that positive has a high vibration, that spiritual truth is a very high vibration, that thinking good has the same very high vibration. That smiling, singing, praising, and giving thanks with common sense and calmness, instead of nervousness, charity instead of criticism. All are expressions of pure love, and this is the state of high vibration, which is equivalent to the most powerful prayer that can be done. To remain peaceful, content and equanimous, is to pray without ceasing. Now I will tell you the full verse of St. Paul, which goes like this, Be joyful always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks to God, for this is the will of God in Jesus Christ, concerning you. Isn't it amazing how the great metaphysician Paul of Tarsus, could summarize in so few sentences the technique of scientific prayer? It is the science of life in a capsule. Be joyful always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks to God, for that is God's will for you. Not a word more can be added, after knowing the whys and wherefores of these recommendations. I have further summarized the teaching, not to appear greater than Paul of Tarsus, but because once you, having absorbed the truth behind the appearance, it is enough to remember the two phrases. Be joyful always, and, in everything give thanks to God. You all already know what they mean. Now, without ceasing, I am going to give you some simple and practical examples which, if you adopt them, will give you the assurance that you are praying without ceasing. The first is greeting. The verb salute means to give health. Do you want anything more generous, unselfish and noble than to greet a friend or relative when you see him or her? However, the greeting has lost its meaning, with habit and routine. It is done only as a gesture of courtesy, to comply with good manners, or if you greet someone you know on the street, it is a simple acknowledgement. The metaphysician proceeds differently. He does one of two things, either he puts intention in the greeting, and along with the smile and the gesture he thinks, I give you health, or he says mentally, I greet your inner Christ. And he does not limit himself only to friends and relatives, but offers it to every person, to whom he addresses, to the cab driver, to the saleswoman in the store, to the picture he sees passing by in the newspaper, to the delivery man, to the collector, to the bank teller, and especially to the crippled and the beggars, who cross his path on the street. These trifles, become darts charged with powerful light vibrations, which do more good to those who receive them, than a casual coin, either for a poor person or for an acquaintance. 
Moreover, this blessing is returned in health and love, which you will see the attraction it exerts, and the good reception you receive everywhere. Never again will you have to complain about how you are treated by all those with whom you interact, and you will be surprised by the praise with which you will be described. This is because goodwill has an irresistible magnet. Do not bless everyone you see. Never bless passers-by or the crowd. Blessing accumulates that which is blessed, and it is not a test of love or wisdom to say blessings to the effects. Instead, bless the truth, the Son of God for the Christ within, whichever term you like best. Whatever image of the perfect self you achieve, invoke it when the opportunity presents itself. It will be you, when you see yourself in a mirror, God and the Son are one and the same. If it is easier for you to think that every atom of what you are seeing is divine substance, think of it this way. Accept your own inspiration, it is the one that suits you, the one offered to you by your God. To give health in greeting is more than wishing for a good functioning of the body. This would be nothing more than addressing the effects. It refers to spiritual health, which is to bless, or to say good to the mind and soul. It is to wish light and truth to others, it is to help cleanse the errors of the world. The world is better off because you are in it. To say, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, with the intention you carry with you, and which has been lost in the world, is to go about spreading goodness and grace. These flow to where the respective cycle ends, and then reflux multiplied back to where they came from, that is, to you. The second way to pray without ceasing is the following, every day you have things to do, duties to fulfill. Some of them bother you, annoy you, are hard for you, others are mere routines and others you like, as pleasant or interesting activities, such as reading the newspaper or attending a party, among others. Dedicate both pleasant and unpleasant moments before you begin. Dedicate them to the good, and if you forget to do it because it is not yet customary, and you remember it after you start and you are halfway through, dedicate them anyway. You will be surprised to see how heavy tasks become so light that you do not even feel them, expenses become real charms. And the great thing is, all those people who are doing the same as you, in different places and you do not even know, benefit from the waves of kindness you are sending. Your light load communicates good mood and well-being to them, and they bless you. The third way to pray without ceasing is this, at night, when you lie down to sleep, let your last thought be, I forgive everyone who needs my forgiveness, as well as myself. Even though I know that on the spiritual plane, there is nothing to forgive, I forgive, because in this way I transform the idea of the one who thinks he has hurt me. I invite my invisible guides to use my dream, to do good where it is appropriate. Thank you Father. It would be very strange if you did not fall asleep instantly, as the guides appreciate your willingness to help. They cover you with vibrations of peace and gentleness, until you are sound asleep. The astral body, separates from the material body when you sleep, and sometimes travels long distances. Those dreams you sometimes have of falling vertically, occur just at the last instant before waking up, when the astral body is returning to its matter. It does not take more than a few seconds, so there is no cause for alarm. Nor has it cost you anything the help you have offered, and that the guides have taken advantage of. If you remember having dreamed, and the dream is coherent and very clear, it is important to write it down upon awakening, as you will later forget the details. It is crucial not to lose them, since most of the time, they contain messages from the Master. You have seen how to pray without ceasing, and without interrupting anything in our daily life. You have discovered how to take advantage of everything that until now, you have been wasting. Only in this way will you be able to afford the luxury of not attending classes or lectures, which are offered to you with so much love, since the Spirit of Truth will take care of instructing you. Although it is not my custom, nor do I suggest anything that contains the slightest threat, it is my duty to warn that the phrase, many are called but few are chosen. It refers to those who have the great fortune to find the opportunity to learn the truth to shorten the long journey 
of their evolution. And who by carelessness, or by preferring things of lesser value than spiritual advancement, despise this effort and do not return. They are the called ones who have not been chosen. It is not because of favoritism that they have not been chosen, for in the Spirit all are heirs of the kingdom. It is because, as the parable of the sower says, the seed that falls on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. But these have no roots, which for some time believe, and in time of temptation fall away. When the seed is lost, many lives pass, before the opportunity arises again. And we close with the phrase of my teacher, If you do not find time to dedicate to God, it is because all your time will be dedicated to problems and diseases. Regarding Spiritism, one of you asked me a question, Why are we Spiritists in past lives, if we were clairvoyant mediums, clairvoyance, if we project and unfold ourselves, why don't we keep the faculty, nor remember any of this in the present life? And I answer you, it is not always so. Some people retain some of the psychic faculty, although not always in the same form, in which it manifested in a past life, as this faculty also evolves. For example, I know a person who is a physician. This is one of the most advanced faculties, among all the psychic faculties. This means that she had faculties, in a previous life or in several, and in this life, she was developed the faculty of doctor. In her memory there is no memory of other abilities, such as clairvoyance. However, we now know the identity she occupied in her last incarnation, and we also know, that she held the ability of clairvoyance, to a significant degree. Another reason we do not remember is that we either misused it and are punished in this incarnation, or it is erased, so that we can evolve in other ways, and not be distracted. The psychic faculties are a great temptation for those who have a different mission to fulfill. The astral plane is in itself very absorbing, in some cases it is interesting, but in others it is torturing. People who begin to develop the faculties, sometimes go through terrible trials and experiences. The fourth dimension, for example, enlarges and sharpens so that, if the person is developing the evidence, he will see gigantic forms coming upon him. In addition, the detractors, which is what the fleshless are called, who have no other distraction, love to frighten and frighten. They appear to them in frightening forms, they persecute and harass them. And so it is with their voice that they make us desperate, with a thousand tricks, threats and torments. When a person has already surpassed the plane of the fourth dimension, they erase his psychic faculties, so that he can evolve and advance in a superior plane. Metaphysics is a scientific study, which needs peace and concentration. It is under the auspices of the green ray, that is why it is called, the truth. If we were subjected to a constant torment of disembodied, that do not let us sleep, with screams and barking in the ear, inside the pillow. If during the day we were persecuted with annoyances of all kinds, we would not be able to study or practice metaphysics. We would go crazy, or assuming that we would no longer be bothered in that way, we would be constantly interrupted, to ask for treatment or help. No, it would not be possible to elevate us to a state of positive consciousness, because it would keep us in a busy attention, in planes of negativity. This is why I tell you that if you are studying metaphysics in this life, it means that in past lives, you have already overcome all the materialistic sects. Don't you think that what I have just said is absurd? There are materialistic religions, such as the Catholic religion, which is eminently material. It does not have the slightest idea of the creative principles, such as mentalism, correspondence and cause-effect. The use of the creative words, I am, when an individual thinks, feels, writes or utters the words, I am, immediately awakens, or alerts the attention of the vital energy in him, and in everything around him. It seems as if the entire universe stops at this signal, to proceed to manifest and give form to what comes next. Why does this happen? Because the words, I am, are sacred, because they are precisely the sign established, from everlasting to everlasting, to indicate to the vital energy, 
that the time has come to create. To create something by the will of the child of God, which is each one of us. Life will obey you, it has always obeyed the mental or audible command, which is preceded by the magic words, I am. In metaphysics it is said that, I am, is the name of God the Creator. That is why we are made in the image and likeness of God, because that is the name of our higher God. Our higher self is the presence of God in the place where we are. Whoever is already aware of this, whoever uses the, I am, knowingly, is with God. This is why we say, one with God is the majority. I mean exactly that when a person already knows the power and value of this name, he never uses it to express a negative decree, a lie. But to do good, to transform an undesirable situation, to express the truth. And truth is one of the aspects of God. Remember the Gospel of St. John, one of the greatest verses of the whole Bible, and the least understood. Now you will see it clearly, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us. The Word is being, first person, I am. That Word is what is called the Creator. The one who uses it knowing the power it contains, is with God, is God at the time and place where He uses it. Nothing in the universe can refuse to fulfill the command. That is why the verse says, It is with God, it is God. When you get home, read the whole chapter so that you will enjoy understanding. There is no greater teacher than your own experience. You all know that every time you do a treatment, every time you have achieved a real miracle, I have told you, do not mention again the problem, the situation or the disease cured. The beginners, when thanking for the treatment, start again to count and comment. Because you can't imagine what it was like, and they proceed to reconstruct the facts, which we have just unraveled. They are reconstructing this, I will explain to them the reason of the relapses, as much in the problems, as in the illnesses. They have to get out of the habit of going back to the same old ways. They are going to tell me the same as always, but it is very difficult to get out of a habit, and why am I to blame for it being difficult? Of course it is difficult, because it is just that, a habit, but you have to get out of it. But, to cut them off, I am going to give them a treatment, it is the way to prevent the problem from coming back. If you remember, Jesus said to every sick person he cured, do not sin again, lest your later situation become worse than the previous one. When a magnificent result has been achieved, with the help of one of the teachers, or one of the already conscious disciples, it is because there has been a very well constructed process, by the conscious person. For beginners are full of misconceptions, full of ignorance. When they half understand that their own words have destroyed what had been gained, they proceed to try to redo that wonderful treatment. And the prayer they express, is more or less as follows. Oh, Father, do not let that wretched bandit, do again what he made me suffer so much. Do not let the disease come back to me, which so many years had me like this. Which is to resurrect the problem, and add fuel to the fire, remembering resentments and grudges. The manifestation that this brings is much worse than it was before the first treatment. The remedy I give you is the following, so that you do not fall into worse mistakes. When you see that the problem returned, after having been resolved, or the disease, after having been cured or significantly improved, you know what happened. Then, say in the following prayer or affirmation, and without repeating it, because it is tremendously powerful. I am the resurrection, and the life of the constructive decree I made, regarding this situation. I forgive myself for this relapse. I am the law of forgiveness, and the transmuting flame of all the mistakes made, by me and by all mankind. Thank you Father, you have heard me. And I will never tire of repeating it, take care of your words. Take care of your decrees after pronouncing the holy, magical, and most powerful, I am. I am the resurrection and the life, of all the glory and the good that I knew with the Father, 
before this world existed. I am perfect. This is the affirmation, which expresses the most absolute loyalty to the Father, to our higher self, and to the Christ in us. I am perfect, or, perfect. However, there are those among you, who do not feel sincere in expressing themselves in this way. I will explain to you that if you feel doubts, it is because you are contemplating the earthly consciousness, what we call the carnal consciousness. And it never wants to accept it. We have been given an earthly, carnal consciousness, so that we can function in the material. If we did not have an intellect and an earthly consciousness, how would we be able to function on earth? We would be ghosts, and we would not feel as if we belonged to the earth. Do you understand? Then it happens that it, the earthly and carnal consciousness, is always seeing the horrors that humans do, the wars, the revenge, the thefts and robberies, the crimes, the deceits, the hatred, the lovelessness, the end. All that we see daily everywhere, in the newspapers, on television, radio, and so on. And with perfect logic, this consciousness is questioned, how can we accept the claim that we are perfect, when our actions are so despicable? Where does that perfection? And what I have just said, surely you, especially the beginners, find it perfectly justified. Well, no, it is not justified, in spite of everything that seems to justify it. You already know that to say it, or even to think it, is tantamount to a categorically negative decree. You already know that the great truth is in the spirit, and that the spirit is perfect. You already know that if you declare the self to be infamous, through the verb, to be, I am, I am, you are lying. You are lying. Besides, you are laying down a decree or law, which is to be manifested in life. And here is the key to the matter, if you declare and decree that something is infamous and imperfect, you know very well that it will manifest. So declare or decree the opposite, which is the truth, and you will also see it manifested. Above all, the repeating is formed by the momentum or momentum. Remind yourselves that the higher self is perfect, and that this is the truth. Keep recording it, manifesting it in all the vehicles that are now believing in the imperfect manifestation, so that you become accustomed to the affirmation. Begin by saying, I am potentially divine and perfect. Thus you are declaring the truth in every way, but do not offend the carnal ears, which are believing the lie of imperfection. Moreover, two points are gained by that statement. The first is that our conscience is raised, which we insist so much on you doing. The second is that it leaves a very pleasant euphoria and joy. It is recommended that you use this affirmation to cure yourself of bad moods and anger, when irritation attacks you. In meditation, there are four steps. There are four galleries that follow one another when one meditates. The first is the image. We start meditating, and we have an image of what we want to know, think, discover, and so on. Let's say we are going to think about the inner Christ. The idea with which we start, is called, the image. It is blurred, mentally and sentimentally speaking. After 20 seconds of thinking about the image, a different, clearer, more satisfactory idea comes to us. This is called, the ideal. We already have a more lucid idea, of our inner Christ. It is not a figure, it is a feeling, an understanding. After 20 seconds of meditating on this feeling, that is, while we are feeling that feeling, as long as we do not remove it from our mind, the consciousness passes. That is to say, we see and feel more clearly. We can almost explain it in words. We could refer it to a third party, we would say something like a wider place, more open, pure, where there is only love, between beings. Twenty seconds later, we have an euphoria, a happiness, a great peace, satisfaction, consolation, contentment, and we are already smiling, with our face illuminated. Any third person who sees us would say, that is the realization. The idea has become identified with our being. Emmett Fox says, Don't analyze God's love, just feel it. 
And I don't want to have to analyze it for you, I just found the explanation I just gave you very useful, and I want it to be useful and convenient for you too. Now you know that you do not need more than 60 seconds to be in contact with God, no more and no less. If you have the interest and patience to keep your mind on a single point for 20 seconds, you will feel the steps I have explained to you. Do you understand now why Dr. Emmett Fox says, that one can establish contact with God, even if you are in the middle of Times Square, and that it is not essential to isolate yourself in any place or state of solitude? Because if you do, you will find that the day you need God the most, you will find yourself in the middle of a riot or an earthquake. All you need to do is to turn your thoughts towards God, and after 20 seconds, you are already in silence, that is to say, in that mysterious state, of which the mystics speak and ponder so much. Silence is simply a state of peace, of love, of trust in God, an instant of intimacy with Him, the voice of your soul. There is an old adage that says, God has a destiny for every being, and of course, He has one for you. Master Fox says that the only problem we have is to find our right place in real life. It is to find this, and everything else happens automatically, we find ourselves happy and healthy. Because if you are healthy when you are happy, then we will be prosperous and with all the necessary supply, to meet all our needs. Which implies that we will be completely free, because you cannot be free, while you are in poverty. Poverty is at odds with freedom and vice versa. But even though you get all the distinction, and all the money in the world, if you are not in your rightful place, that which God made for you, then you will not be happy. The universe is unified harmony, a divine plan in a divine blueprint. There cannot be a superfluous peace, or something unwanted. It cannot be that God, created a spiritual entity like you, without a special purpose. This means that there is a special place for you. And since God never repeats himself, as your fingerprints prove, it means that this place, created especially and only for you, cannot be occupied by anyone else but you. There are no two people who express themselves identically. This is why there can be no real competition. There do not have to be 2,000 people, fighting to obtain the same place. That place is for only one of those people, and there are 1,999 other placements for the others. But how can we know our own place? Maybe you consider yourself to be nothing wonderful, and you doubt that God has any wonderful occupation for you. Your life is perhaps monotonous, unadventurous, and you are thinking that it is very unlikely that it will suddenly be filled with beautiful and splendid things. And supposing it is so, how can you figure out how to make it happen? The answer is simple, like everything of God. Since long before this moment, God has been whispering to your heart, that wonderful thing He desires for you, that thing so incredibly fitting. And that which you dare not even mention, for fear of being ridiculed. That desire that seems impossible for you to fulfill, that is the voice of your soul, that is the voice of God calling you to take the place He has reserved for you. Do not make excuses, that your obligations make it impossible for you to do what you want, etc., etc. Or that your family or the conditions in which you were born. The truth, confess it, is that you are frustrated, and frustration is the essence of negativity. If you are frustrated, you are not fulfilling the Father's will. Therefore, at this moment you are engaged in things, which are not to your liking and satisfaction. And you must be doing them badly, or less well than you could be doing them. You are already forcing yourself, and to force yourself is to distort the soul. You are also depriving a large sector of humanity of something that only you can give them. By their fruits you shall know them. If you are discontented and annoyed, without illusions, you are dissatisfied, because you are not occupying your place, or doing what belongs to you. So discontentment is useful, because it tells you that you should pray scientifically, so that your place is presented to you. It is something you love to do, it is what you enjoy doing the most. Remember the following, when God calls you to His service, 
he pays all the expenses, in whatever currency is necessary. Whatever you need to fulfill your mission, God provides, money, opportunities, knowledge, training, freedom, strength, courage, everything. As long as you are willing to join your will to His, the voice of your soul is the voice of God, and that voice must be obeyed, sooner or later. The contract of today's earthly consciousness, every family that is formed, every couple that marries and has children, is dedicated to accumulate a fortune. This fortune is achieved, if at all, at the cost not only of work and sacrifice, but also using all sorts of modern tricks of wit, picaresque, malice. Or settling whenever he can, whenever the partner or the buyer, that is to say, the payer of the moment is rich. It is not taken into consideration that the payer has a lot of obligations in proportion to his means. He has money and can pay, that is the slogan. In turn, the payer knows that he will be overcharged, and tries to get everything at half price, trying to squeeze the seller of the moment, assuming that he wants to take advantage of it, whether this is the truth or not, it does not matter. I'm not going to let them rip me off, is another slogan. There you have the two slogans, he has money and can pay, you have to get it out of him, I will not let them swindle me, he wants to cheat me. That is the conscience of robbery, which reigns everywhere. This consciousness, like thoughts, are transmitted, enter and leave the minds, and stay wherever they find affinities. They are received by the backward, those of little evolution, and drive them to theft, robbery and crime. That is one of the reasons for the current underworld. This constant tension between part and part, makes it impossible to think of anything else. The attention is focused on the fragile physical body, which deteriorates with ulcers, due to the restlessness and calculations, persist over time. Or with health problems such as cancer, as the poison of worries, seeps into the body. As well as in heart attacks, since the love of the heart, which is the balm that soothes and heals everything, is not used at all. On the contrary, the more intelligence and less sentiment, the better it is for business. I could go on enumerating the evils caused by these, but I think that these examples are enough. These slogans and this consciousness extend through all the activities of life, not only in a business of buying and selling. In a hospital, one patient is cared for and another is operated on, with an eye to your pocket. The only love that is evident is that of the surgeon towards the work of his hands, but it is not a pure love, just as it would be if this doctor would be devoted to his patients. Of course, there are always those who act with love, but in general, they act as best they can for vested interests. The surgeon operates as best he can, out of a combination of interest in the matter he is operating on, and interest in his prestige, and this is not virtue, understand. He does not care if he is branded as a thief or a profiteer. The thing is that they say that he is a great surgeon, that there is no other like him, so that this fame allows him to charge whatever he wants, without considerations. The love for his work is, therefore, bogged down by profit. And so that all this profit serves to buy houses, cars, trips, clothes, furniture, which in turn raise the prestige, to acquire objects that become mandatory, because everyone has them. The most expensive schools are paid, and children are dressed, with the most luxurious clothes you want to acquire. This constant pugilate, needs the mind to be occupied all day long, in all this material sequence. Not a moment of thought is given to the spiritual, to the conditions to be found on the other side, as if this did not exist, nor was it necessary to even consider it. On the other side, what they find is the following. The physical body is a sponge, which absorbs the mental, psychic and sensory excesses, and causes the excessive emotionality that we endure, because we have a body that absorbs. No one knows that this absorption, becomes damage to organs and skin, which get sick, are the constant ailments of all humans. After death, there is no physical body that absorbs, and uncontrolled emotionality, ill-mannered, runs amok. The being, is more sensitized and feels everything deeply, 
here's everything they say about him, those who have remained here. As these do not know that the one who died is listening to them, they speak, tear, exaggerate and slander as they please. The one who listens to them despairs, because he can neither debate nor disprove, he cries out for reincarnation, to get rid of the torture and obtain oblivion. There remains the reincarnation, the unconsciousness of past evils. That is the hell that I have just described, it is purgatory, if the evils are made to endure until they have left, and have withdrawn. The day of death arrives, and what matters is that the life and the children have been well founded, proof of misery or hardship. It is considered, that young people have been given a good education, because they are taught to conduct themselves in life, with the same set of tactics. If she is a woman, let her marry a boy of the same conditions. The way to relieve mental and emotional fatigue, aggravated by the negative environment, which prevails in the daily routine, is to attend a celebration, or even organize one. Always in the hope of elevating the spirit, by means of. Instead of releasing karmas, which is, ultimately, the purpose of our stay on earth. Consequently, more karmas are added to the existing ones, forming dense layers, which take the form of crystallizations. These, to be dissolved, require earthquakes, floods, cataclysms. And this is what the seer media are seeing, because the collapses that are occurring in the plane of these crystallizations are due, first, to the violet light that is slipping into some minds. And secondly, the number of people who are students of metaphysics is increasing, and consequently, they are denying and affirming virtues. This spreads analogous vibrations, which act wherever they make contact, with other equals. As above so below, so below so above. If here large machines are indispensable to dismantle rocks and hills by force of blows, the same thing happens with these crystallized constructions. They need blows to disrupt them, first to break them, second to crush them, and third to clean and sweep away the dust. Now, on the spiritual plane, there is one more condition that does not exist on the earthly. Every such monstrosity, manufactured by us, by our minds and our feelings, have life, think, hear and speak. What they think and say, is always related to the material they were given, at the time of their creation. If it was a creation of fury, of hatred and revenge, at the moment it is released into the air, at the moment the crust that imprisons it in our conscious is disrupted, she goes out into the air screaming everything that made her. She does not want to leave, that is her creator, and fights to stay with him. The media, in a clear environment, they hear them, and believe that they are people who are chasing them. They perceive in the words the thoughts, which they themselves directed towards others, which inevitably, like everything, return. They hear the voices crying out against themselves. This phenomenon, which we call persecution, persists for a while, until the victim learns to reject it, to deny it, to affirm, to meditate, to pray, to invoke the violet flame, and other methods. But if they are not metaphysical, as they learn at last, they withdraw by going to other human cavities, for whom these mental states, are necessary in their evolution. It seems that this is a contradiction, but it is not. A very shy person needs a reflex of decision and strength. It is called, reflex, to the performance of his thoughts already formed and stable, in the subconscious. You already know that whenever a favorable opportunity is offered, the subconscious supplies the necessary reflex. If our thoughts have been good, correct, happy, a reflection of well-being is produced, and a happy situation manifests itself. If they have been negative, the opposite is produced. Now, by the law of action and reaction, excessive shyness attracts its opposite. The reaction opens the field for the opposite force to enter and lodge. In this case, it is a benefit that that creation of violence, which has released someone who no longer needs it, is going to lodge in the mind of the excessive shy, because the combination produces a middle ground. Each condition acts on the other, and produces the reflex that the shy person needed. 
People who are not clairvoyant do not hear their creations crying out against them, but on the other hand, they do feel a horrible discomfort of guilt. They do not know how to explain themselves, and as they do not know how to defend themselves against what they neither see nor hear, they suffer a lot. They attribute to themselves all kinds of reasons that are not exact, they punish and blame themselves. They talk a lot in their depressive states, and this makes them worse. This is why it is said that the initiates suffer a lot, but providence takes care of them, and helps them to find their teachers, and their Christ. They are initiates and already know the way, and the way to act. I am teaching you now, for when you face these ancient states of consciousness of yourselves, so that you know what to expect and know how to catalog them. Above all, so that you know how to transmute them, dissolve them with the lights, which you will learn in the next book, entitled, The Wonderful Number 7. You cannot be in debt, if you are dedicated to living in the spiritual realm, deserving peace in your soul, and progress in balance. If you feel that these facets are faltering, ask divine wisdom to reveal to you the cause of this decline. It is your duty to devote a reasonable amount of time to daily prayer, in the form of meditation or spiritual reading, or a review of your favorite affirmations, and live the rest of your life in accordance with the divine will, as far as you can. If in reality, you are doing that duty sincerely, you can do no more. And you need not be anguished or reproachful or feel guilty that you are not achieving what is not possible for you at this present moment. Instead, it cannot be your duty, to do something that is beyond your strength, or your reach at this moment. God is your Father, and a loving Father never demands the impossible. Even a child who behaves well with Him, it cannot be your duty to do what you do not have time to do. God is infinite wisdom, which on earth is manifested by common sense, and it is not common sense, to expect more duties to be fulfilled, than can fit in a 24-hour day. If you are facing such a situation, is that something is going very wrong in your thoughts. The first thing that is evident is that you believe that God is a gigantic ogre, who threw you into the world with his hands tied, so that you would fail once and for all. Remember Psalm 46, which begins by saying, God is our refuge, our strength, and our help in trouble. Then it ends by saying, Be still, and remember that I am God. But you must believe this, firmly affirming it, and not simply repeat it like a parrot, for it is your faith that moves mountains. It cannot be your duty to do something that sacrifices your own integrity, or your spiritual power. No one in the world can force you to lie, for example, and it is not true the appearance that there is no work, or that there is no service, or that money is hard to come by, or that everyone is getting sick. Bullshit. See for yourself, affirming it and believing it to the contrary. You must not compromise your spiritual advancement, nor your own integrity, by letting circumstances, impel you to contradict it. It cannot be your duty to do today, what really belongs to tomorrow, on the spiritual plane, which is the truth. There is no time, no past, no future, everything happens in the present. And if you think and say, believing what you say, that today everything is solved today, that today all needs are covered, and that you have all the strength, all the peace and all the help you need. And that tomorrow will be another, today you will realize that truth. You will also understand that our fears are always for a problematic tomorrow, never for today. The Bible says, today is the day of salvation, today is the accepted day, because God lives in an eternal present, is never in a hurry, and is always in a smiling rest. It cannot be your duty to fulfill a remote duty, sacrificing a duty near at hand. The Sermon on the Mount, says to first take out the filth that is in your eye, and then the beam that is in your neighbor's eye. For if you do not first cleanse your sight, you will not be able to see to help your neighbor. You cannot be in a hurry, sad, discouraged, angry, resentful or antagonistic, under any circumstances. The Bible says, The joy of the Lord is my strength. This means that in order to be successful, to be able to work, to obtain our achievements, to be happy, for our well-being and our advancement, 
we have to be positive. And positive means to be content, because the Christ within us can do nothing for us, as long as we are negative. He rejoices in our happiness, and distances himself when we allow negativity to take hold of us.